that's a good cue right there. When the music just cuts off, that means it's time. I'm, I, I'm so thankful that Kevin didn't have a long word this morning because I've got a long word this morning. <laughs> I didn't want to keep you here that long, but I figured, Kevin, thank you for, for, for really feeling the Holy Ghost on that one. That was awesome. Well, good morning. Welcome to Destiny Church. I am DJ and me and my wife, Jules. We get the honor to pastor here at Destiny Church and and we love our church. We love our family. This is not just a church. This is a family of people that gathers. Um, so we love you guys, and we thank you for that. And we're just excited about what God's been doing. Um, so it is exciting to see everybody this morning. If there's a new family here, or this is the first time in a while, do us a favor. Fill out a Connect card. We, we need that information. When you fill that out, we get it, and we reach out to you uh, in multiple different ways just to touch base and see if you have any questions about the church, if you have questions about anything, or if you need prayer, that's important. Like, like we, we want to know that we're praying for people, and, and uh, so we can't do that if, if you don't fill that information out. So please let us know. Um, if you want more information about our, our church, you can download the app or go to our website. So I love the app. It's up to date. It has everything, and I love the website. So you choose which one you want to go to, but you can download the app. It's right there. You get push notifications. But uh, there's all kinds of things happening at Destiny all throughout the week, so you just figure out when you want to get plugged in, how you want to get plugged in, where we can do life together, and uh, we look forward to seeing you here. So uh, today started off, actually kicked off our Next Steps uh, Discipleship uh, series, but unfortunately uh, we had to cancel the first one only because there was a, a scare of COVID. So, you know, you come in contact with somebody and you think you might have been around, so that person was like, hey, I'm just going to take a break and and not show up, and that's perfect. That's, that we we thank you for that. If you you feel something, you don't feel good or whatever, just just it's okay to miss church, okay? So that's okay. But let us know, like if you're not here, and, and just let us know so we can pray for you. And make sure that we cover it in prayer because that's what matters. So next week on the 16th, we're gonna pick it right up with the spiritual gift assessment. This is really cool. Uh, if you haven't done that before, if you want a refresher, God has blessed each of us with gifts. Uh, and it's awesome to hear about them, to see how he's working in your life and to connect those two things. So it helps you identify those things and, and is really good information so you can start walking out the destiny that God has for you. So um, please show up. That's at 9 o'clock every single Sunday at 9 o'clock. We'll continue to build that list so you know in advance what's going on. And we'll just be excited about what God wants to do. That's part of our discipleship plan right there. So these are these are things that you're going to hear probably in the in the annex in a more intimate setting so that i'm not going to be up here probably preaching about them now i might it doesn't mean i won't it just means that you get an opportunity to hear about all this stuff when you need to hear about it um and it's a little more intimate for you so i'm excited about that um the next thing i want to talk about is our xo conference and and come on i'm excited about our xo conference marriage conference uh february 11th and 12th right there you can sign up online let us know you're coming this is an amazing event every year we do this it's been ongoing now i think for probably five years i think at least five years we've been doing this this turns into a banquet hall this is a two-day event man it's sixty dollars a couple invest in your marriage that gets you child care that gets you food for two days that gets you like door prizes all kinds of fun stuff it is worth the investment invest in your marriage um and please and we actually have a video so a little promo video if we can play that in the back You have a 100% chance of success in marriage. You just need to do it God's way. A strong marriage rarely has two strong people at the same time, but it's often a husband and wife who take turns being strong for each other in the moments the other is weak, and then together realizing that it's Jesus who's holding you. The aim of our marriages, church, today is that we would transform by the power of the Spirit of God into the likeness of Jesus himself. May the God of hope fill you all with joy and peace as you hold hands with one another. Come on, doesn't that look good? Come on, I'm excited. It is a, it's a simulcast, so what we do is we get to hear all these big time, you know, people giving great advice and investing, you know, they're giving you tools for your marriage, and we get to have them all right here on the screen live, so it's really awesome. So please uh, check that out. You need to sign up online, let us know. It's all out there under the events page. So that's what I had about that. So let me pray, because I want to jump right into a word that, that God's been messing with me now for two weeks on. So 
I really believe I might need some time on this one. So, Father, we love you, Lord. We thank you, Father. I thank you for what you're doing in our house this morning. I thank you what you're doing in our life. And right now, Lord, I ask you to touch my lips, touch my heart. Father God, let everything I say be all of you, none of me, Father God, and anoint it right now that these words will not land on deaf ears, Father. Father, so we, we just surrender to you in this. Have your way in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Okay. Woo, man, this is good. If you are new or been around for a bit, this is our 10th week of a series. I don't do series. No, this is our 10th week of a series on what we call rules of engagement. Uh, rules of engagement. It's all about spiritual warfare. Uh, our job as pastors and leaders at Destiny Church is to equip the saints. So our job is to equip you to go into battle. Okay, and the battle is every day in your mind. That's the spiritual battle in your mind every single day. So our job is to equip you, give you tools, give you everything you need. Talk to you about the weapons that, 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 that Father gives us to combat and all those things. Why? Because if not, you're waiting around for somebody to come pray for you. If not, you're calling the church or showing up saying something's wrong with me and I don't know what to do. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, we are here to do that. But, man, wouldn't it be better if that when you start recognizing that the enemy's messing with you and you start understanding it's spiritual warfare that you know how to handle that? Where you can just start coming against what the enemy's trying to do. That's why it's so important. That's why it's so important that we cover this. We're building a foundation, a foundation that, that will strengthen you as a, as a Christian. Okay, and then this is going to give you all the power you need, okay, to continue to do what God wants you to do. So I loved it last week. If you weren't here, man, Kevin brought the word last week. Amazing word, brother. Come on. I want to give it up to you. Because it was such a good description. He, you know, we've been talking about spirits, different spirits, and how to combat spirits. And he said, you know, let me talk to you about strongholds. Because they're different. You know, and he talked about, you guys remember this, he talked about the sunglasses. It's like having glasses on. Right, where you have sunglasses on and you start seeing things differently because you have glasses on. I always think of those yellow sunglasses and everything looks brighter and greener. And I'm like, man, everything's great. And I take them off and it's really a dreary, rainy day. But in my head, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's beautiful out. It's beautiful out. It's, you know, and it works just the opposite way. He'll tell you things are bad through those glasses. The enemy will. And when things are actually really good in your life, but he'll start bringing up things and talking about things. And, and that's why I love that example. What a great analogy of how, we, how the glasses represent what a stronghold does. So, um, so that was really cool. And, and with that, we talked about 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 5. I don't even know if I gave them this, but, but it says, for, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they, are divine, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Yeah. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. That is so important when we start breaking down strongholds, that you take every thought, because it's a battle of the mind, and, and guess what? You make it obedient to the Word. You make it obedient to what He says. So if it doesn't line up with his word, it's of the enemy. All right, so this is how we start recognizing and identifying what the enemy is trying to do in our lives. So I thought it would be a good idea to talk about um, some strongholds. And these, are, these aren't always strongholds, but, but the thing I'm going to talk about today could lead to a stronghold if you let it. And this has been on my heart now for a couple weeks. So today I want to talk to you about something very serious. It's called regret. Regret. And, and wow, whew, this one can get you. This one can get you. There are so many people that carry with them the pain of their past. They carry with them the pain of um, something that they could have done differently, something that, that they could have said differently, something they, 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 they could have spoke differently. Any, this, this is about, you know, uh, something you regret maybe saying to somebody or maybe, maybe you did something to affect somebody. I mean, regret can be all kinds of things. So you see, God didn't intend for us to carry around heavy burdens and baggage in our life. So what we do is when we start regretting things, right? So, some regret is real quick and you can get over it. I mean, regrets are that there's a normal process to regret. But if you hang on to it, if you continue to let to focus on that as an individual, it turns into a stronghold. And it's one of the most powerful strongholds you can run into. Because every time something good starts happening in your life, it'll hit you. It'll choke it out. 
because you start thinking about your past. You start thinking of something you did or something that happened to you. So it's this, the enemy, he just tries to weigh us down with those things. He tries to stop us from living our life with the freedom that Christ gave us. He tries to weigh us down with that. And it stops you from walking out the plans that God has in your life. So what are some regretful situations? So just some examples of lending money to somebody. Maybe investing into something that you regretted because it cost you money. Maybe you borrowed money from somebody. You know, it's funny. I I lived in that as a teenager. Uh, I borrowed money to buy basketball shoes because my parents didn't have money when I was in school. So I was like in the eighth grade, I borrowed money to buy basketball shoes from a guy that had a job in school. And then my parents moved and I left for years. And, I, and that, this was back before they had you know, Venmo and PayPal. And it wore me out because I thought I've never taken something from somebody. And, and we moved states away. So I got very lucky one day when we decided to go back Right and visit, I chased him down. I found him. He was very frustrated at me because he didn't know the story of you know when you're 12 or 13 and your parents move, you don't really have a say. You just kind of jump in the car and go, <laughs> you know. And, and I was able to bless him uh, with everything he gave me plus some, which was really awesome. Uh, and why it's not a regret anymore is unfortunately that young man took his life like two three years after that. But I got to know that he knew before that happened that, man, I wasn't trying to do something evil. Or, but it tore me up inside as a regret. So every time somebody talked about money, I didn't want, I didn't, I, it was just, it just wore on me as an individual. All right. So these, that's how regret will get you. Okay. If bad things happen, bad things happen. But it's when you constantly focus on those bad things. So it could be taking a job that you thought was going to be a great job and it turned out to be the worst thing ever. Maybe you went to school and you studied for years and you don't use your degree and you don't do any of those things. So you regret the fact that you've invested all that money into something you don't even use. I don't know if I'm hitting home with anybody. It could be relationships. A lot of people will look at relationships and they just look back and go, wow, I can't believe. I can't believe. I can't believe. Okay, so maybe it's just being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And maybe you're just not there. I've been in those places. And all of a sudden it haunts you for a long time that, that you were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Could be parenting failures. I mean, I know we're all amazing parents. And we always <laughs> had amazing parents. You know, but but this one, this one was good. You know, when I started writing this down, there was something that popped immediately in my head. You know how bad that is when it pops immediately in your head and you're like, oh, man, I, I let that one go for so many years. You know, and I remember my son, I coached him in, in every sport, but I coached him in football from, you know, seventh grade up until, I mean, seven years old until he was in high school. And I coached him in high school for a little bit. But when he was 12 years old on the football field, he came over and he said something to me that was just a smart comment. And I was the coach and he said it in front of his friends. So I'm going to be real with you. I lost it. I lost it, and I told him where to go, which was, you're getting in the truck. I don't even want to see your face. And then he hesitated and was kind of like, well, I'll go when I want to go, so I shoved him down. Dad of the year. I shoved him face first into the ground in front of all his friends. Then he got up, and I shoved him down again because I wanted to make sure he knew that I was serious. You know, that haunted me for years. I quit coaching because of that because I let it tear me up and I was like Lord can you just free me from that you know and it didn't just haunt me it haunted him because we had a good family talk one day and that was the one thing he brought up and I was like wow I go it was that serious so you know we had to send that to God I was like hey we just need to surrender this to the Lord because it'll it what it is it took me out of something where I was doing God's work I wasn't just coaching football man I was pouring into these young men's lives some of these These men didn't have dads. Now, they didn't want a dad like me because they watched what I just did. But, man, I was pouring into their lives, and we were praying together, and we were doing this. And I just said, you know what? I can't do it anymore. I'm a bad influence. So I walked away from doing something I was passionate about that I really loved, that I was really good at because of regret. Okay, and that will tear you up. So I don't know, 
you know, what you're thinking about when I talk about regret. The definition of regret is sorrow or remorse over something that has happened or that we have done. So regret can also be a sense of disappointment over what has not happened, such as regretting wasted years. So, you know, it'll hit you hard, too. You ever been driving in the car and you're listening to the radio and a song comes on? A song that takes you back to a time when you were depressed, a time when it was emotional, a time when maybe you lost somebody. It takes you back and you start doing what? You start weeping. You start getting emotional. That comes back in. And when you have a choice, you can change the dial, right, and turn it to a whole other station. But we don't. We leave it right there. And we go right back into that moment, right back into that place. It's regret. We have a choice to make sometimes. Sometimes we just got to turn the dial when it starts working up in our lives and say, I don't want to hear that anymore. It's not for me. That was in my past. We leave the past in the past. Because when you respond that way, when you turn it back over to that, it's just the enemy drawing you back into something that you were trying to walk yourself out of. Okay, but we give him the right to draw us back in when we don't change the station. So we need to be able to turn the dial. So what are some things that are popping up in your head? I want you to grab a hold of them because we're going to talk about them today. (laughs) I want you to grab a hold of them because I want you leaving here today better than you came in. I want you leaving here today knowing that you don't have to carry that anymore. That's not your burden anymore. That happened in the past. We leave it in the past. We can't do anything about that. Because if you don't, if you don't get rid of it, it becomes a stronghold. And then you have to deal with the stronghold, which is extremely hard. And the enemy is going to try to use all that against you to stop you from doing what God wants you to do. The enemy is going to come at you. He's going to say things, uh, and it's going to sound like this. Because of this, uh, you're not good enough. Because of this, you can't be used. Because of this, you're not worthy. Because of this, you're going to mess it up. Because of this, nobody trusts you. Because of this, everybody's judging you. That's what it sounds like. So if you've heard those things... That's just the enemy speaking into your head. It's a battlefield. Your mind's a battlefield. And that's how the enemy plays against you. So we got to win the war. Right? We, we got we to take it to the enemy. And we do that with the truth. Right? We come at him with the truth and what the Bible says. And I'm telling you, I struggle with this a lot in my history, thinking of what God wanted to do with me in my future. That's hard. When God tells you what he wants to do with you in the future, and you're like, yeah, but. He goes, there ain't no buts, man. He goes, I took all that. I've forgiven all that. I don't even remember all that. But we do. We try to hang on to that stuff. And we we try to play play that card when God asks us to do something. So I think of it like this. Your life is like a very large, like, ship. I don't know. You would think I'd know something like about ships because my son's in the Navy, but I really don't. <laughs> it's a big boat. <laughs> and it's cruising along, and regret is like this gigantic anchor that is just caught up, and you're dragging it along the whole time, and it's stopping you from progressing where God wants you to go. And you have the right to cut the anchor off, if you would just do it. But we get so caught up with that that we forget that the anchor's tied to the boat. <laughs> and all we got to do is untie it. <laughs> but we get so caught up with the issue that we forget that we have the ability to walk away from it. And here's the thing. You know, regret's not just that you wished things turned out differently. Regret is knowing that it could have completely been different if you would have made a different choice. That's rough, but it's true. That's regret. That, that, that the, the, the end result would have been completely different if I would have made a different choice. You know, I, I relate it to watching football. If I'm watching a football game and my team lost, which didn't happen last night, by the way. <laughs> that was for you, Kevin. But if your team, if your team loses... You don't regret the game because you weren't in the game. You're upset because you're like, eh, we lost. 
but you don't regret it. The people that regret it are the ones that are in the game. The people who regret it are the ones that, that had a chance to kick the field goal and they missed it, or the ones that, that, that had a chance to throw the touchdown and they failed to throw the pass right, or they failed to catch it. Those people regret it because they're like, I had a chance to catch it. I had a chance to win, and I didn't do it. So that's, the day. that's how regret works in your life. I remember uh, a time with, I'm a, I got son stories today. Hey, Bo, you're a pastor's son. It's all used in the sermon. I remember his senior year in high school, we had a, they had never made it to the playoffs. He had played on a varsity football team since he was a freshman, never made it to the playoffs, and he was the quarterback. And last game of his season, and if they won the game, they were going to the playoffs for the first time. And he had like a minute and 30 seconds left, and he had to drive them all the way down the field, and he did. He got inside the 20. They only had like one play left, and all he had to do was make the pass. And I, I watched him. I watched him go out, and his favorite receiver that he had been like, you know, ten for ten with that that game. He tried to lead him and tried to throw it to him. He's double double coveraged. They missed the pass. They didn't make it. The whole time there's a guy he's never thrown the ball to standing wide open on the other side of the end zone. And he didn't see it at first, but then once the pass dropped, he dropped to his knees like I just lost the game. And then every time he watched the, the replays on, on, you know, huddle and watching film, he's like, I cannot believe I missed that. I can't, you know, he never played football again. Never touched the sport again after that. Had opportunities to, but chose not to. Because sometimes we get so caught up in those moments, we're like, I'll just mess it up again. See, that's how the enemy gets us. The enemy will come and grab you when you're doing something you love to do that has purpose behind it. And if he can just get you to say, I'm not good enough, I can't go any further, he wins. And that's a spiritual battle. That's what that is. It's a spiritual battle. And that's why we're talking about it under rules of engagement. Amen. So here's the thing. This weekend, we've been, uh, it's been kind of like cleanup weekend at our house. It's the beginning of the new year, so we're putting away all the Christmas stuff. Anybody doing this? Put away all the Christmas stuff cleaning out closets we're like hey how do you gotta we gotta make room in the house because we just like to collect stuff right i don't know how our closets get so i've got stuff in my closet but i've got uniforms that's from the military in my closet and i retired eight years ago they don't fit me right now but i'm getting there I'm getting there hey i've got i've got an accountability partner from the military and 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 she called the other day and she was or text me and she goes hey you said you need accountability. How are you doing? And I'm like, I'm doing great. I lost eight pounds in a week and a half. So I'm like, I'm doing good. I'm going to get there. I'm going to get back in my uniform. But, you know, they're just hanging there. They don't need to be. I'm never going to wear them again. Like, I don't even think I can because I think they're all out of date right now. Okay, but, but here's the thing. Not only uniforms, man. I've got T-shirts in my drawers. What is up with guys in T-shirts? I'm like, there's sentimental value to that. What's it mean? I don't even know. I just, I've had it forever. I don't even wear them. They just, they fold it up in my dresser drawer. So it's time to clean house, right? It's time to get it out of there. But what I hate about Christmas stuff, and this might be you, is that we pulled like 15 big containers out for Christmas. You put everything up. The containers are still full. And then when you go pick them back up to put everything away, they get full. And now you need to go buy more containers every year. It doesn't make any sense. The house is not getting any bigger. Our house is completely decorated. I'm like, something's wrong. And you know what it is, is we hang on to stuff. And it's just clutter. And we hang on to it and we refuse to go through stuff and get rid of stuff so we can make room for other stuff. Well, personally, I think we, we, we have, we have a, a, an inner cluttering of our mind. And what happens is it gets filled up with our past. It gets filled up with our mistakes. It gets filled up with these regrets that we constantly think about. And because of that, we have no more room to even invite in what God's trying to do in your life. Like, like we, we, don't have, we, we don't have a cloud. This is not the cloud in your head. You don't have unlimited storage. At least mine doesn't. I think <laughs> It might be a personal problem. We'll talk about that later. That's another sermon. You can't change out your hard drive. You have so much space. And when it gets cluttered with all the other stuff, you can't bring in the good stuff that God's trying to do in your life. So you've got to clear it out. 
you got to move stuff out. you got to sift through things. you got to say, what stuff that I don't need in there anymore because it doesn't belong in there? Like, I don't even have a right to hang on to it. Because I gave it to God a long time ago, and he took it. But I decided that, man, it's, you know, I just, it's just there. And, and I've got to have this thing, and I've got to keep it there. Because that's what the enemy wants us to do. So it's this annual cleansing of regret that we need to do each and every year. Because stuff happens. See, it's not, like I was saying, it's not regret. Regret's not the bad part. It's when you hang on to regret. It's when you don't clean it out. So I don't know what happened to you in 2021, but there's stuff in 2021 I don't want no more. I don't even know why I would even think about bringing it into 2022. When God says, I've got an entire year in store for you, a new season, a fresh opportunity, and I want to fill you up, but you can't even take it on because you didn't get rid of the other stuff. So he says, get rid of it. Clean it up. Take time. Don't, don't go try to buy more storage. You, you, don't do it. I've got a big house and a big barn and a storage unit. <laughs> don't do it. Because you can continue, you can continue to buy stuff. I'm trying to fix it. Is that better? Our sign's really good. You next time just yell, brother. <laughs> I thought you were choking or something back there for the last five minutes. Here's the thing. There's only one thing that stands in the way of you having a powerful, wonderful future, and it's your past. That's what stands in the way of it. Because God says, I've, you're my child. I have forgiven you. You gave it to me. I took everything you've done. And I'm trying to push you into the future with a plan and a purpose and a destiny. And you're hanging on to the past. And the only thing stopping you is you. That's it. And you might go, yeah, but it's not bad where I'm at because I'm actually enjoying this. And it's good. It's just not great. And he says, yeah, but I got great. You're just settling for good. We don't settle. As God's children, we don't settle for that stuff. He's going to continue to bless us and push us and use us if we just say yes. And I want to talk about, I want to look at um, Judas in the Bible. What a story. And uh, you've probably heard this a, a ton of times, but if you don't know, Judas was handpicked by Jesus to be one of the 12 disciples. There's a lot of disciples, but there were 12 really close ones. Okay, And, and these disciples were handpicked by him, and he spent time with them. He, I mean, these, these guys were, were the boys. They hung out. They preached together. They did everything. So he, he had it all going well. He was real close to Jesus, doing the right things, all right? And he gave up everything to be with him because that's that was, that was the call. If you wanted to be with Jesus, you gave up your family. You gave up your jobs. You gave up everything to follow him. And the Bible says he probably followed him around two years. But you got to piece that together to figure that out. But it was about two years that he walked with him. So for two years, he was living with Jesus, walking with Jesus. I mean, you got, come on, how many of you would be willing to do that if he walked in the room? You'd be like, oh, no. <laughs> Hide me in the back. If he sees me, he's going to say something. These guys walked with him, ate with him, prayed with him. So this is where I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to talk in, in Luke 22, 1 through 6. I'm going to read out of the Passion. And I'm going to pick it up. This is right right before the Passover, right before he's going to talk about communion, right before he gets into all this stuff. So I've got to lay this out. So we're going to pick it up in Luke 22, 1 through 6. It says, as the celebration of the Passover lamb was approaching, the Jewish religious leaders and scholars of the law continually schemed to find a way to murder Jesus without a riot, for they feared the crowds. At that, at that time, Satan himself entered into Judas, the locksmith who was one of the 12 apostles. He secretly went to the religious hierarchy and to the captains of the temple guards and discussed with them how he could betray Jesus and turn him over to their hands. The religious hierarchy was elated over Judas's treachery and they agreed to give him a sum of money in exchange for Jesus's betrayal. Judas vowed that, that he would find, the, uh, find them a suitable opportunity to betray Jesus when he was away from the crowds. So here you see somebody that's walking with Jesus, intimate with him, and Satan enters into him. 
Okay, I'm not talking that the regret comes from them. I'm not saying that. It's, I'm, not, I'm talking about the action. Okay, so, so that's a spiritual attack. You know, sometimes you, you do things that you just don't want to do. Sometimes you do things and you go, how did that happen? How did I end up in that situation? Well, I'm pretty sure in this one, Judas is like, I don't even know what I'm doing. Like, he's worshiping with Jesus, and now he's going to turn him in. And the Bible doesn't get into why, so you got to figure this out yourself. So I'm going to jump down now to uh, verse 47 through 48, just because there's a whole bunch of stuff in between. And it says, no sooner had he finished speaking, so Jesus was speaking, when suddenly a mob approached, and in front of the mob was his disciple Judas. He walked up close to Jesus and greeted him with a kiss, for he agreed to give the religious leaders a sign, saying, the one I kiss is the one to seize. Jesus looked at him with sorrow and said, a kiss, Judas? Are you really going to betray the Son of Man with a kiss? So Jesus even knew it was coming. And he walked him through this. So I'm going to jump all the way down to Matthew. I want to jump over to Matthew 27, 3 through 5. And this is where Judas finds out. So now, Ju now it says, now when Judas, Judas, the betrayer, oh, wow, his name changed. You know, before they called him a locksmith, and now he's Judas, Judas the betrayer, saw that Jesus had been sentenced to death. Remorse filled his heart. That's regret. The regret was the remorse filling his heart. He returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and religious leaders, saying, I have sinned by betraying an innocent man. They were replied, why are you bothering us? That's your problem. Then Judas flung the silver coins inside the temple and went out and hanged himself. So a man so filled with regret, they didn't even know what to do. That he gave up everything that God was working in. This is somebody that's been hanging out with him. He's been watching miracles. He's been seeing this stuff. And Satan gets a hold of him, a spiritual attack, and he does something that he probably wouldn't do again. But then instead of dealing with it, he kills himself. That's how regret gets you. That's how regret grabs a hold of you if you don't surrender that to somebody. It doesn't mean it's going to kill you. What it means is it's going to starve out any bit of whatever God wants to do in your life. And you won't be able to move any further along in that relationship. So because of regret, he hung himself. He could have easily just confessed, repented, and been restored. That's the difference could have confessed, repented, and been restored. Then he could have joined the other disciples, and there would have probably been a consequence, because there are consequences to everything we do. But he could still be doing what God wanted him to do. But he traded it all in, because he couldn't deal with it. So if the enemy can't get, if the enemy can get to a disciple, do you think he can get to you? So not everything we do is because we really want to do it. But everything we do, we don't have to hang on to it after it's done. We can surrender that to Jesus, and he can walk us through and clear us up so we can continue on the path that he has for us. But we think everything's the end of the world. See, your past is, is not your past if you're still impacting your present. Your past is not your past if it's still impacting your present. So what's impacting you right now that happened in your past? It's history but you're allowing it to stop you from doing what god wants you to do because it's out there there's a bunch of it there's a bunch of it and i can't read all your minds i can read some of them so watch out <laughs> but i know there's a lot of stuff here's the thing if the enemy can get you so focused on your past mistakes that you quit doing what god wants he's winning that's a win in his life that's a win in his life because God doesn't redeem you and restore you so you can sit around and say Jesus is great he comes with a plan and a destiny and he says if you'll just say yes if you'll just do what I ask you to do I'm going to use you in a mighty powerful way but man you got to let that stuff go you got to let it go you got to start walking in what God wants you to do 
See, God's passion is to restore us, to redeem us. And he wants to give us purpose. He wants to give us the purpose that he destined us to walk in. Because here's the thing. There, there's no one too broken that God can't put back together. There's no one too far gone that God can't snatch back up. Okay, but the only thing that stops him from doing that in your life is you. You're it. You're the one that denies it. You're the one that doesn't accept it. You're the one that won't walk through it. Because you get so caught up in the other stuff. See, God's bigger than your history. He's more concerned about your destiny. More concerned about your destiny. Ephesians 2.10 says, We have become his poetry, a recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each of us. For we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one. Even before we were born, God planned in advance our destiny and the good works we would do to fulfill it. I love that because it says we're his poetry. And in, in, the, in the footnotes, it says our lives are the beautiful poetry written by God that will speak forth all that he desires in life. Your life is poetry to him. And it says the good works. These good works make up our destiny. As we yield to God, our prearranged destiny comes to pass, and we are rewarded for simply doing what he wanted us to accomplish. That's my theory of just say yes. Because if you're saying yes, then you're walking in purpose. It's when God tells you to do something and you say no, that you got to answer that question, why not? And a lot of times it's regret. A lot of times it's your history. It's what you've been through. It's what, it's what you're scared of. We just have to say yes. And if we're doing that, you're walking out your predetermined destiny. When God tells you to move, move. When God tells you to do something, it's yes. When he asks you to do something, just try yes. When the fear comes in and the anxiety comes in, and you're like, I don't know if I could actually do that. I have a fear of speaking in front of people. So the yes was big when I was like, eh, <laughs> I don't think so. Like I was a poor, poor reader all through school. Hated it. Wouldn't read. I, would, I was a great storyteller, so I would rather read the back of a book and then tell an amazing story about it. <laughs> Used to get A's. It worked. I don't understand. Creative writing was probably my thing. But I hated reading. So then go through college with that where... All they say is read. And then, then go become a, an instructor at college level leadership. And they go, you have to read all these books so you can write curriculum. And you're like, I don't like to read. <laughs> so he'll push you and challenge you. Why? Because he wants to use all that stuff in your future. But you have to say yes. I had to say yes to all those things. But see, once I welcomed Jesus into my life and once I surrendered to him, I just made a point. And I said, Lord, if you ask me, it's yes. It's been a journey. Like, it's been a journey to go from where I've been to where I am right now. And it's not because I was worried about my past. It's because I said yes. I didn't care. I just said, you know what? It is what it is, Lord. I gave it to you a long time ago, and you cleared it all up. So why do I care? So I'm just going to say yes and let you do what only you can do. That's why I love it in our church. You know, our mission statement is, Love God, love people, and live your destiny. It means we're going to love God with all of our heart. And we're going to love other people the same way he loves us. And then we're going to live our destiny. We do that by saying yes. When he tells you to move, you move. That's living your destiny. That's what that means. We're going to live our destiny. We're going to do what God asks us to do. And we're not going to give him a hard time about it. We're going to be brave. And we're just going to say, all right, that's what you said. I'm going to do it. But you can't do that if you're living in regret. You can't do that if you're living in your past. You just can't live your destiny when you're stuck in the past. You guys doing okay? It's a lot about your past right there. And that, that's kind of tough. But here's, here's what I know. If, if you don't transform your pain... 
you transfer your pain to everything you do. You've got to transform it into what God wants it to be used for. If not, you just simply carry it with you. And you're like, well, I'll just get a new job. That'll fix everything. You take it with you. Ah, I'll just serve somewhere else in the church. You take it with you. Okay, you've got to transform it or you're just going to take it with you. Okay, surrender it to him. Give it to him. Let him do what only he can do. You got to remember, this is the biggest thing. I think this is the one thing I had to work on in my life is that, that who you were yesterday isn't who you are today. So quit living in yesterday. I mean, mistakes have been made. Bad choices have been made. We get it. Leave it there. That's history. You can't do anything about history. Nothing. So why are you worried about it? Like, give it to him and walk away from it. And say, now, God, I'm going to start walking in what you want me to do. Man. You have to move on so God will continue to use you. If not, guess what? You're going to stay stuck. And he wants to continue to use you in a mighty way. Okay. There's a pretty good chance then after all that that we've all kind of experienced some kind of regret. (laughs) You guys good with that? Because it got really quiet and I was seeing a lot of people like, oh, man. Don't read my mind. So here, here's the thing. Um, there's different kinds of regrets, and some regrets um, are personal. So it's just an internal thing. It didn't affect anybody else but you. And you hang on to that so tight. <laughs> when the only person that's affected by it is you, and you have complete control over what you do in your life and what you forget about and what you remember and and what you do with it. Then you have other stuff that affects other people. And that's tough too. Because when, you, when it affects other people, you got to deal with that. Right? So you, you, you've got to be able to manage that because you got to do damage control and all kinds of things. But so, so you really got regret that affects you and regret that affects other people. So I want to help you with a list of things. Um, I know it's like therapy session. A list of things that's going to help you walk through this to get you from regret to walking out a purpose in your life and saying yes to what God wants you to do. You guys good with that? All right, here's the first one. You need to accept the reality of the thing you regret and confess it. You need to accept the reality of the thing you regret. Quit denying it. Whatever it is, it is. It happened. Whatever. It's done. You can't deny it. You can't go back with an eraser and go, I mean, I can do that on this cool new iPad. Love it. I can write something and go back and just erase it. It's awesome. Can't do that with my life. It's there. You know, so, so it happened. Mistakes are real. It is what it is. Okay, we, we just need to accept, accept what has happened and learn from it. Right? And then confess it to God. See, that's the key. Um, you can't hide it from him, but confess it to him. And tell him, look, oof. This is what I did, and you probably already know. But I'm going to come before you and say, man, what a mess I made. What a mess I made. 1 John 1.9. 1 John 1.9 in the Passion says, But if we freely admit our sin, our sins, when his light uncovers them, he will be faithful to forgive us, forgive us every time. God is just to forgive us our sins because of Christ, and he will continue to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He will continue to cleanse us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So he will forgive you. You confess it to him and he forgives you. That's that's the first part. Confess it, accept it, confess it, give it to God. He's going to forgive you. And then the, the second point is you need to forgive yourself. You're like, that's part of it? Yeah. Because you beat yourself up over it all the time. You need to show yourself the same kind of mercy you would expect somebody else to give you if you apologize to them. We don't do that. (laughs) We're really good at beating ourselves down over everything. So you've got to show the same mercy to yourself that you would expect Jesus to give you. Think about that one. That might have solved everything for you. (laughs) We are the worst enemy of us sometimes. We will dwell in everything we do. 
when somebody else is like, really? I mean, we've talked about this before. We've, we've held, you know, worried about talking with people in our lives because we're like, man, they're going to be so mad at me. And then when you talk to them, they're like, what are you talking about? I don't even remember that. And you're like, no, I've dwelled on this for like five years. And they're like, I don't even remember it. Because it was bigger to us than it was to anybody else. But see, when we walk in regret, what's big to us, we think is big to everybody. And everybody else, they don't care. <laughs> they're like, walk in freedom. Like, like, surrender that to God and walk in freedom. And there's times that we actually, we actually think that if we hold it against ourselves and we're really hard against ourselves, that it makes it praiseworthy. Like, no, but I'm doing this to suffer for God, and He's going to be proud of me because, man, I'm punishing myself. No, He's like, He gave it to me, I took it. Quit taking it back. Like, I'm, I'm sick of this. Every time you ask me, I take it. And then sometimes I took it, and then you ask me again, I don't even know what you're talking about. Right? That, that's not praiseworthy. That, that, that's, that's competing against him. See, here's the thing. Forgiving yourself won't negate the thing you regret, but it will set you free from the power it holds over you. It doesn't, when you forgive yourself, it doesn't negate anything you've done, but it gives you freedom from the power that is clamping on you. That's so important. You need to forgive. Forgive yourself. And start walking in the full grace of what God wanted you to have. Hmm. Number three, make amends. So this way, if it has affected other people, you got to make amends. Okay, if, if your regret has wounded somebody or something, you need to go to them. You need to do the best you can to mend that fence. But don't get so caught up into it that you let them tell you how much you should do. That's not what it's all about. You'll know in your heart when it's enough. And then once you make amends with it, don't worry about it anymore. It's no longer your problem. You did what God told you. You can't sit in regret saying, yeah, but I didn't. No. You did everything. Okay, so you, you, so you need to make amends. Number four. This is a good one. Now, after you've done all those other things, you need to forget what is behind you. See, because now you've already confessed it and all that. You need to forget what's behind you. Leave the past where it happened. Leave the past where it is. Don't keep talking about your failures and mistakes. Now, there'll be a time, like you say, yeah, but testament, testimonies are great. Testimonies are so that when you're healed and you're free, you have a testimony. Not when you're struggling to keep going back saying, yeah, but I did this, 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 this. That's not a testimony. That's reliving your past. Okay, and what you're doing is just poking yourself even more, reminding yourself about how bad it is. So you need to release anything that reminds you of the regrettable action. Romans 8, 1, 8, or Romans 8, 1, Romans 8, 1, from the Passion. So now the case is closed. There remains no accusing voice of condemnation against those who are joined in life union with Jesus, the anointed one. The case is closed. You know what it means when a case is closed? You can't reopen it. <laughs> you, you could have another offense, <laughs> but the case you're dealing with is gone. It's closed. It's been settled. He took it. Quit trying to reopen it. You're wasting your time. When the judge says it's final, it's final. There's no more appeals. Leave it alone. Accept the judgment from him that says, I've forgiven you. I've taken it. I've shut the door. Now walk in peace and walk in purpose and walk in destiny. Start saying yes to what he's telling you to do. There's freedom in that. You gotta remember, man, when we ask for his forgiveness, he forgives us, cleanses us. The Bible says he makes us white as snow. We become new creatures. Brand new. And we gotta leave it there. It is finished. Have you heard that before? Jesus said that when he was hanging on the cross. Right? He said, To tell us that it is finished. He paid the price. He's telling you that all the time. When you take something back to him, he goes, it's finished. I took it. Walk in peace. So you need to accept it, confess it, forgive yourself, make amends, and then forget it. But here's the final thing. 
you got to do the opposite of what you regret. <laughs> you got to do the exact opposite. You ever heard that? Repentance isn't just turning and walking the other way. It's to change the way you think. So you need to change the way you think about it. You need to do the exact opposite of what you're regretting. So if it was the way you talk to somebody, don't talk to anybody that way anymore. Make sense? So repent, change the way you think. So we can't change the past, but we do have control over it and how we live and, and how it affects our lives moving forward if we just release it to him because regret's painful. But it's also an effective teacher. We can learn from it. We can definitely learn from the stuff we regret. So regret, so what you want to do is you want to replace regretful thoughts with positive action. That's what you need to do. Replace the regretful thought with positive action. What's that mean? I don't know. Do something to channel that energy somewhere else. Whatever that looks like. Uh, put, put it into maybe read something that inspires you. Maybe the Bible. Read his word. That's a good one. But anything, read something that inspires you. You know, uh, do something nice for somebody. Maybe, maybe gift somebody with something or bless somebody with something. Do something that's positive in your life to get your mind off the negative stuff that you put there. So be kind to everybody you meet. Smile once in a while. That one works real well. But here's the thing. We're regretting. We're all regretting something in some way. And, and what we need to do is, is, is harness that, get rid of it before it turns into a stronghold. Because it's not that regret's bad. Regret is a learning tool, all that stuff. It's when you hang on to it for so long that it becomes a stronghold in your life, and now you can't move forward. In Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, I had a lot of scripture today. But I like this one because we always turn it on the husbands, but I like actually why we're talking about it. So it says, And to the husbands, you are to demonstrate love for your wives with the same tender devotion that Christ demonstrates to us, his bride. This is where I really want to pick it up. <laughs> because this is, this is how he, his, his devotion to you. He died for us, sacrificing himself to make us holy and pure, cleansing us through the showering of the pure water of the word of God. All that he does in us is designed to make us a mature church for his pleasure until we become a source of praise to him, glorious and radiant, beautiful and holy, without fault or flaw. That's what he does for us. He paid that price so that you could be without flaw, that you could be holy and pure. But man, we keep bringing it back up because we hang on to it. And we steal what he's trying to give us. We just take the joy right out of it. When he says, man, you're pure and holy and without fault or flaw. So you need to think about that when regret starts stirring up in your, in your body. You need to get rid of it. I love what Paul says in Philippians 3, 12 through 16. And Monica, if you want to come up, I'll wrap it up once I get through this big, you know, 12 through 16. This is Paul speaking. He says, I admit that I haven't yet acquired the absolute fullness that I am pursuing, but I run with passion into his abundance so that I may reach the purpose for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me to make me his own. I don't depend on my own strength to accomplish this. However, I do have one compelling focus. I forget all of the past as I fasten my heart to the future instead I run straight for the divine invitation of reaching the heavenly goal and gaining the victory prize through the anointing of Jesus man he goes I forget everything else and I run straight towards him with all my heart here's the thing we all know we can't go back and change the past so why do we keep trying there's just some things in life that no matter how much you wish you could change them, you just can't. And God says, you're just going to have to live with it. But if you surrender it to me, I'll make it so much easier. I'll take away the pain. I'll take away every bad thought. 
is if you just say yes, I'll start directing you in the right direction on a destiny that I, I built for you. I built you for a purpose and a plan before you even came to this world. And I'm just, he's just trying to keep us on track. He's just trying to get us back on the track that he had for us. And the only thing stopping you from getting there is you. You keep putting up blockades that you, you're putting in your mind. If you could just accept what he's trying to tell you and walk in it. Sometimes there's nothing we can do but pray. Ask God for his help. Let it go and move forward. So this is where we make that choice. We can choose to accept the things that we can't change and then choose to let God's grace cover us for that situation and let him work it together for good in our lives. Or we can choose to hold on to the pain. We can choose to listen to our own voice instead of his. We can choose to not accept freedom and the gifts that Christ offers us for free. And the choice is yours. I look back at the examples in the Bible of people that completely messed up. And I think about Judas. He killed himself because of regret. But Paul, who killed a bunch of other Christians accepted his forgiveness and continued on the path that God made for him and he made a difference. Peter denied him three times, accepted the forgiveness and walked out the path that God wanted for him. It's a choice. Judas could have done the same thing, but he let regret grab a hold of him. So here's the thing, the cross is the only safe place for regret. Lay it at the foot of the cross. Regret can turn into repentance and repentance can turn into redemption. So here's the thing, if you're in the process of of building this huge mountain of regret, stop. (laughs) Just stop. There's no value to that. Give it to him, cleanse it out, get rid of it, start accepting the true word of who he is and who you are through him. One more thing, if you're carrying the weight of regret on your back, stop. I love that word. Just stop. It's just a choice. You just have to make a decision. Are you going to change the dollar or are you going to hang on to the same station? Because that's what we're doing. We just like to leave it there and sit in what, what we thought we made. But he said, just change the station. You don't need to listen to that anymore. See, time doesn't heal all wounds. God does. So you can think you can take time and work through it. And God says, no, nah, just give it to me. You don't have to wait that long. Because <laughs> I'll take it right now. And you can walk in freedom if you're willing to do it. Amen? Come on. So today we've been discussing regret which obviously leads to a stronghold so i think that's important that that you understand if you hang on to it too long it becomes a stronghold we talked about tearing down strongholds so the weapon of regret is a satanic abortive weapon because it keeps you connected to your past rather than living for your future i'm into these tagging lines today so remember yesterday's in the tomb and tomorrow's still in the womb if you'll release it. It's amazing what God will do. But you gotta leave yesterday in the tomb. Quit going back and trying to break it out. See, regret led Judas to hang himself. His other option would have been confession, repentance, and restoration. Three acts that had the potential of salvaging his ministry and giving him a future. Regrets lead people to live with I wish, what if, and if only. That's a bad way to live your life. So how do we counterattack regret? This is as a stronghold. How do you counterattack it? You ask God to empower you to overcome pain, guilt, shame, humiliation of the past. You gotta ask God for that. Live a life of purpose. Live life in the now, not in the past. And every step you take that you listen to him, every time you say yes, what you're doing is you're squashing the old you away. You're pushing it down so far in the dirt it can't even raise its head anymore. 
Because every time you say yes, it's so important. When God asks you to do something, he's trying to help you out of what you got stuck in. Because once you do that enough and you say yes enough, you don't even remember your past. There's a freedom in that. There's a freedom going, man, I'm just living for Jesus every day. And then somebody goes, weren't you that person? You're like, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, I was at some point. Yep. Not anymore. Now it's a testimony. See, that's the difference. Instead of talking about regrets, let's, let's just share a testimony of what God did in us and through us because we released it to him. So accept forgiveness, forget the past, and look forward to what lies ahead. Isaiah 43, 18 through 19. It says, stop dwelling on the past. Don't even remember these former things. I am doing something brand new, something unheard of. Even now it sprouts and grows and matures. Wouldn't you like to be that one thing that's, some, that's something unheard of? Like God can use you so much that it's something that nobody's ever heard of. And when you do it, they're like, there's no way. And you're like, yeah, it's unheard of. He said, oh, he's going to use me. And I just said, yes. That's huge. And all it's waiting for is for you to accept it, receive it, and say yes and walk in it. So maybe that is you today. Maybe that's it. Maybe you're just stuck dwelling in your past. Maybe you just got some regret and you need that off your chest. Maybe you're still looking back at 2021, maybe even 2020, and you're still living those things out. And you're trying to carry all that into 2022. Well, there's no room. It's time to put that stuff back into storage, you know, and you don't want to buy any more containers. Start cleansing through it. Get rid of all the old stuff as we move forward. Only put the good stuff in there. Maybe you just haven't forgotten. Maybe you just haven't forgotten about all the stuff that God freed you from. So you're just dwelling in it. Maybe it was a bad relationship, bad finance. I don't even know. Maybe you just keep taking the same thing back to him all the time and asking for forgiveness. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's your story. Well, here's the thing. I want, I want you to leave here better than you came today. So I'll just ask you this. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to make sure I'm talking to the right group of people. And if you're watching online, man, let us know. Let us know as you're watching online. Look, if you feel like you've been under attack, if you feel like you've been dealing with some kind of regret in your life over these years, man, can you just lift your hand so I know who I'm praying for? Because, man, I see him. We want to catch this before it turns into a stronghold. So we want you to walk in freedom today. We want you to walk out of here today with such a, a weight lifted off from your shoulder. So let's pray. So, Father, right now, whew, we come to you, Father. We love you and we thank you. We ask you to search the hearts and minds of those in this room, Father, and those watching online. Father, right now we come against the strongholds of regret in our lives. We bind up what the enemy is trying to use for evil against us. And we lose your forgiveness, your purpose, your plans for our lives, Father. We, we, we lose that. We lose our destiny, Father God, the destiny you created for us. We lose that on these people today, Father. Father, open your eyes to, to what is... Open our eyes, Father God. Father, open our eyes to what is yet to come. Hmm. Open our eyes to what you want to do. Open our eyes to a life that's so much better than what we have right now. Let us taste and see your goodness, Father. We surrender it all to you. Have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Did you guys get something out of today? Look, there's a lot of stuff, and I apologize for the length. <laughs> but, man, it was needed, and you need to walk out of here free this morning. So I'm going to ask our prayer partners uh, if they'll come forward. Because here's the thing. If that was you, if you're living in that, don't leave here with it. We have prayer partners that know how to pray for these things, and you're not in this alone. So I really am encouraging you to come up talk to somebody let's pray over this and let's get it out of your life and let's move on let's leave all the weight at the altar let's just leave it all here walk out of here free knowing that god has a plan for you and then all you have to do is say yes so any of those things man come on let's just 
release it to them. Here's the other part, though. For all this to work, man, you got to be on the right team. <laughs> you got you to surrender your heart to him. You know, there's a lot of this. That I've seen people that want what you have. They just don't know how to get there. So I'm telling you, it starts with a relationship with him. It really does. And there's nothing I can say over you or pray for you that's going to bring that relationship. That's a decision you're going to have to make in your heart to trust him with everything. To say, Lord, you're going to take it from me, and I believe it. you got to believe in your heart. So I can't do that for you. But we do have a bunch of prayer partners that would love to come together with you. And if you want to make that decision today, come talk to them. Because we want to pray with you. But my prayer for you is not going to do it. You understand? This is something you have to do internally. You can't earn your way to this. You know, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, not from yourself. It's a gift from God, not by works so that nobody can boast. Nobody can boast that they've done something good to get to heaven. You can just surrender that. You can just say, Lord, just do it in my life. So the first step of war is to know whose team you're on. And if you want everything we've been talking about, that all comes with that trust for him. So I'll ask you, if that's you and you want to receive him into your heart for the first time, or maybe you've stepped away and you want to just renew that commitment, I'll challenge you to come front. Come up front this morning. As we break up, as we dismiss to leave, come up front. Take your time. And if there's people already getting prayed for, that's okay. Stand around. Wait. It's worth the wait to walk in freedom. Okay, we're all family here. We just want to see you walk this thing out. We want to help you through this. So if you need prayer for anything else this morning, please, uh, you can come forward too. I just want to pray us out and uh, dismiss us this morning. I thank you guys for coming out. So, Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to share your word. We thank you for the word spoken today, Lord, and I ask that they don't fall on deaf ears, Father. Father, ignite a fire inside of us this week, Lord, to seek you out with all of our hearts. Father, I ask you to release the plans and purpose you have in our lives to us. Show us a destiny, Lord, that, 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 that's for us, Lord. We pray that you use us in a mighty way this week. Father, we ask for divine appointments this week, that you'll put people in front of us that need to hear about you. And we thank you for choosing us to do your good works, Father. So, Father, we surrender to you. Have your way in our lives. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said amen. Come on. Look forward to seeing you guys next week. We love you all. God bless.